If we haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Jeff, and I'm the senior pastor here at Church on the Hill. Welcome. We are so glad that you guys have braved the weather and you endured the rain and the cold. You are clearly God's favorite people, so thank you so much for joining us in worship. Hey, let's do this real quick. Let's give it up for the band. I mean, good worship. Oh, so good. So good, so good, so good. We're so, we're, you know, listen, I tell you, I tell you this frequently. We're really a blessed church because, you know, not only do we have, I think, a great team of communicators, but we have an amazing worship team and the talent that is here both at our early service and in this service is just bar none. It's fantastic. So again, from, from me to those leaders and those who continually get here early and do their thing, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Hey, this is the series that we're in. We're in the Gospel of Matthew. We began it on January 1, and so we're kind of tracking through Matthew. We're going to be there until uh, sometime after Easter, probably the Sunday after Easter. We'll wrap it up, and then we're going to jump into the book of Acts through the the season of Easter. But we've chosen to kind of walk through Matthew, and there's no way we're going to be able to cover all of the Gospel of Matthew in those numbers of weeks, but we are going to hit some highlights, as we, uh, especially in this series, as we discover the kingdom. So we're digging in, understanding maybe a little bit about what this kingdom idea is is. And so that's kind of where we are this morning as we kind of continue on. And so we are in the passage that was read for us this morning, Matthew chapter 5. That's where we are. And so I would invite you to simply do this. We're going to take a moment. We'll turn our heart to God and we're going to open in prayer and we're going to dive right in. Let's pray together. Holy God, we give you ourselves. We just, in fact, Lord, we take a posture of expectancy let me just invite you to just open your hands, kind of like right where you are. Just, just open your hands. Just, we strike a posture of openness and receptivity, and we just simply say, God, we come not holding anything, so deposit into us what it is that you would have us to take away from this place. Having been in your presence, God, I pray that you'd open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Call our spirits to attention in the name of Jesus. Do the work you've longed to do so that we could be who you've longed for us to be. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So we've said it. Everybody in this room at some point in time, I'll guarantee you, you've probably said this. You sat down at a meal. You, you took your napkin. You, put, you got your napkin. And you're holding your utensils. You look down at your plate. You, maybe, maybe you turn your plate. Anybody turn their plate? Anybody like, you see, like, you may, Anybody turn your plate? Come on, admit it, right? Like just a few of you. Yeah, okay, my people. And we turn our plate, right? Because you're like, don't want to start over there. I want to start here. You know, you turn your plate, do the thing. You got your food, you cut into it, you take a bite. And then you go in your head, you're going, "Mm, not right. And then you turn to somebody sitting next to you and you say what? My people, pass the salt. That's right. That's exactly right. That's it. And so what you're saying in your head, right? In that moment, you're going, something's not quite right. It needs something. And so you, you, you ask for the salt. Now, listen, it's a simple request, right? But everybody, we've all said it, you know, it just, it just kind of needs something. Or maybe, you've, maybe, maybe you cook and maybe you're making something and you get somebody else to try it. And you're like, hey, taste this, would you? You're like, what, does it miss anything? What does it need? You go, I don't know. Maybe some salt, you know, something. And then there's the times when our doctor tells us, maybe your doctor has told you, you need to cut back on your salt, you know, your sodium. It's just, you got, you got to scale that back because if you don't, you're going to wind up with high blood pressure, you know, a host of other issues, that kind of thing. Did you know that scientists estimate that an average human being needs about a two thirds of a pound of salt, which means we need 16 pounds of salt a year to stay healthy. It's on the lower end if you're not that active, by the way, right? Just it's kind of the way it is. And if you don't get enough salt, a salt deficiency will cause you to be lightheaded. It'll cause headaches and weakness and nausea. And if salt deprivation lasts too long, you can die. Although an overabundance of salt in your system can do the exact same thing. So salt, it's this thing, it, it, it encompasses who we are. And then of course, there are people who get serious about their salt. Like they have gourmet salts. Now, did you know this? Yeah, like when did pink Himalayan salt become a thing? I have no clue. I don't know, but they've got it, right? They've got Celtic sea salt. They've got beach sea salt. They've got, you know, garlic Mediterranean and herb salt and rosemary salt. And, you know, they've, they've got all this kind of stuff. And then we even have, we even have foods that, that never had salt on it that have salt on it now, right? Like salted caramel. Yes and amen, right? I mean... 
Like, you know, that's just good stuff right there. I remember the very first time I ever ate a chocolate covered potato chip. Somebody offered it to me the first time. I went, ooh, gross. And they went, no, 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 just try. And I tried it and I was like, where have you been all my life? I mean, it's got sweet and salty. I mean, it's, it's like the flavor combination that heaven is made of, you know? I mean, it just, it just is. It's incredible. Salt, actually, in the consumption of it and the acquisition of it, goes back thousands of years. It's really this, this human quest for and consumption of salt. Mark Kurlansky wrote a book called Salt, A World History. In it, he tracks the history of salt as a mineral that has oftentimes been more valuable than gold. He goes all the way back and says it may have started May, we're not real sure, with the ancient Chinese when they started mining this as early as 6,000 BC, carries into biblical times and even into today. It is a staple, salt is, of human culture. In first century uh, biblical times during the day of Jesus, it was was oftentimes used as cash currency. You could pay for things in salt. Roman soldiers would march over land and sea to conquer the world, nations and empires in the name of the Roman Empire, and sometimes those individuals were paid with salt. In fact, the Latin word for salt, sal, S-A-L, became the basis for our word salary, which then morphed into the word soldier. It's also the expression of where we, get this, uh, where we get this expression, he is worth his salt, or he's earning his salt. That's it. Today, the salt industry says that salt has over 14,000 uses. And so it's quite literally the Swiss army knife, if you will, of uh, minerals. In the biblical times, it was, the, it was used principally as a flavoring agent, as it is for us today. And it's also a preservative with modern canning and refrigeration. We don't use it as much as a, as a preservative, but you can still, you know, preserve meat. You know, you think of salted pork and salted meats and things like this. Homer, the great 8th century Greek poet, not Simpson, just to clear the air. <laughs> Homer, the Greek poet, called salt the divine substance. Plato said it was especially near to the gods, Israel and the Israelites took it to another step. They incorporated salt into their worship and ritual practices. They would salt the sacrifices. And so when they salt the sacrifices, what it pointed to was it pointed to this eternal nature and the preservation of the covenant between them and God. It was, it's called the salt covenant. You can find it in Leviticus chapter 2 and Numbers 18. And then there's other images, biblically speaking, for salt. Like salt can even be an image of judgment on cities and people. You think of Lot's wife who's turned into a pillar of salt, right? So it's no wonder, right? Like Jesus uses this imagery in, his, uh, in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He uses this very common everyday element that people would have been used to to describe uh, who we are supposed to be and how we are to live our lives and even the cost, if you will, uh, of following him in the world today. This gospel of Matthew, just by way of review, Matthew's doing something really, really fascinating in the way that he sets up the early portion of his, his account of Jesus' life. Unlike uh, other gospel writers, Mark, for example, Mark gives you a fast overview of the events of Jesus' life. What Matthew does is Matthew focuses in on the teachings of Jesus. And in fact, what you're going to get in, in the gospel of Matthew is you're going to get Matthew breaks his gospel into five components. It's five sections. Those five sections, they say, correspond to the first five books of the Old Testament. And so, it's in, so in the first five books of the Bible, we see God communicating to humanity. In the five books, of the book of Psalms. Psalms breaks down into five as well. It's humanity talking back to God. And then Jesus comes and he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He comes and he talks with us and we talk with him. And Matthew gives us five sections of teaching. And so here we are, we're in one of these sections of teaching. And so he does something really fascinating is the way in which Matthew lines up this life of Moses and Israel with the life of Jesus. He is born and then he goes into Egypt and then he lives there and travels out 
and comes through the Red Sea. And it's the same thing. He's born. Jesus is born, goes into Egypt, comes out, and then he, he gets baptized in chapter three. We saw that a few weeks ago. And then he goes into, Brian led us last week into the desert. And so the Israelites are in the desert for 40 years and Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. And, and it's almost as if uh, what Matthew seems to be saying is this. It says, somebody's here that's greater than Moses. And so Moses, by the time we get to chapter five of Matthew, in the Old Testament, Moses would have gone up on a mountain and west where he meets with God and gets the law. Jesus goes up on a mountain and the people come to him. And so in the Old Testament, it's like, no, 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 you go be with God and just come back and tell us what God says. And so there's this separation between God and people. But here, what we have come into the New Testament, we've got this, this ability to come into the presence of God. And so he goes up onto a mountain, reinterprets the law in the Sermon on the Mount, and the people are there. And so they're having this conversation, and that's where we are. And so this is where we are. And so these Beatitudes, the front part of chapter five, really represent for us who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live our lives. Like this is the value structure of citizens who live in the kingdom. Never ever read the Beatitudes and go, well, that's the ideal. We just aim to do that, knowing full well that we're gonna fall short. Never say it's an ideal. The Beatitudes are never an ideal. The Beatitudes are the standard. The Beatitudes are the standard. This is the way in which we are called to live and we are supposed to be living our lives in the day in and the day out. Now, the, the, the reality is we're gonna stumble and fail. And so the Beatitudes aren't necessarily a spirituality. The Beatitudes are a geography. They tell us where we stand. And so because Jesus is here and he's, he's giving all this and Jesus is saying, you are my people. And, and because you're my people and these are the values that I'm calling you to live by, I, I need you to know not, not only just where you stand, but I need you to understand who you are. And so we go back into the fifth chapter of Matthew and we look at verse 13 and he tells us who we are. Look at verse 13. He says, you are, read it with me. You are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say you could be the salt of the earth. He doesn't say you might be the salt of the earth. He doesn't say, do you want to be the salt of the earth? He no, he says, you, you got it. You are the salt of the earth. This is, this is who you are. In other words, we are the church of the living God. We are called to be society's flavoring agent. We flavor a bland and tasteless world with the kingdom of God everywhere we go. Do you remember how we've been defining the kingdom of God? It's such a big religious term. And it's just, it's, I mean, books are written about this, but we're just trying to boil it down to get it down to the basics. Here's how we're defining it. The kingdom of God is God's all powerful rule and reign over all creation. There is not a place on the planet where God's rule and reign does not extend. It may feel like it, but God's rule and reign fully extends because the kingdom hasn't come in its fullness, right? Like, like we live between this time of Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose, he ascended, he poured out the Holy Spirit and he will come again. So we are caught right here in the in-between. It's this idea of the already and the not yet and we're caught right here in the middle. And so it's literally, we live, meanwhile, back at the ranch, that's where we are. This is the place. And so what Jesus is trying to get us to realize is your life, the way in which you live your life in the here and the now, Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday, you just get to come back here and get filled back up again so you can go back out there and you just get to flavor the world. And that's the idea. There's got to be a distinction, he would say, in the way in which we live our life. And it's what Rachel called us to earlier as we were worshiping. It's the sold out, all in, committed, give everything to God kind of lifestyle. And that's it. And so what he's saying is you've got to avoid a danger because there is an absolute danger in viewing Christianity through the lens of the world and the culture. Because when you do, if you're not careful, this is what will happen. Verse 13, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, when I was younger and I used to read this, I was like, how does salt not be salty? Salt is always salty, right? Like, I mean, you just, you put stuff on there and you're like, mm, that's salt. You know, how does salt lose its flavor? Unbeknownst to me, and I didn't know this, 
But salt, actually, when it was originally mined way back in the day, back during like Jesus' day, it could be they could pull it from wherever they were, they were digging it up. They could pull it out, and it may not be fully pure. Now, the Morton salt, right, <laughs> the stuff in the blue thing that we buy you know, in the stores, that's pure salt. That's, that's, that's pure. But sodium chloride, which is salt, could be impure. There could be impurities in it. In fact, so much so that it can look like salt, but it not taste like salt. You ever known people who look like Christians but weren't Christians? Okay, never mind. We won't talk about that. But that's the idea. That's the idea. And so, what, and so, so if you got salt that wasn't salty and had impurities in it and, and it, it wasn't really salt, what would you do with it? Throw it out. You throw it out, and that's what he says. He says it's thrown out, and it falls on the pathway. People walk on it, and it gets hardened, and it turns basically into the path. That's it, and so that's this idea. And so they would throw it out, and so what Jesus is saying in these verses is that as the followers of him, if we're going to really change the world, well, I would say one life at a time, because that's it. I mean, that's all you got to do is just change the world one life at a time, then we got to live we got to live our life like pure salt. we got to let our light shine. We, we, in other words, we have to be the real deal. Our lives can't be a mixture of impurities. Our lives can't be lived as, 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 un, as uncompromising and impure and so forth. Instead, instead or, or rather compromised, we want to be uncompromising and pure and authentic. So what Jesus is saying when he says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying, I need you to be the real deal. I don't need all the rest of the world's impurities mixing in with you. I need you to be the real deal. I need you to be authentic with everything that you do and all of your, all of your happenings and all of your conversations and the way in which you're dealing with people and, and all this kind of Don't look like the world. Don't look like the world. There are enough churches, there are enough Christians that look like the world. Stand out. Be distinct. And and then he uses another metaphor. You are the light of the world, right? Be the light so shine so brightly that other people will see the all-powerful rule and reign of God operating in and through your life. Let me ask you a question. You ever had too much salt on your food? Yeah, absolutely. You ever known the knucklehead who like back in high school would like unscrew the salt shaker lid, just like leave it propped up there. And then you pick that up and you're like, and you're like, oh man. Yeah. Right. No, just me. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But but you've had, you've, you know, you've gotten French fries or something like that, or maybe you made something or whatever. It was just too salty and you couldn't eat it. And you're like, Ooh, that's, it's just got way too much on it. That actually, this idea of having too much salt, it's really a good illustration of what happens when the church forgets what it's called to do. You know the difference between, uh, you you know, well, let me ask you this. You you know what salt and Christians and manure have in common? They're only good if you spread them out, right? Because if you get too much of it in one location, it either tastes bad or it stinks, and that's Christianity, right? Like, like that's us. Like you don't want too much salt in one spot. You don't want too much manure in one spot. You don't want too many Christians in one spot. We just need you to spread out. So when you come here, right? Like, like this is sort of like a salt shaker and that's good, but then you leave here. But then you leave here and you go into the world and you flavor the world with the taste of the kingdom. And so you flavor meetings and appointments, time with patients, sit downs with employees and clients and family members and neighbors and anybody that you come in contact with. It doesn't matter. When you leave here, chances are you're going to go eat. And if you're going to go eat, flavor your conversation and the people around you with the kingdom. For this is who you're called to be. You're not called to look like the world. You're not called to act like the world. You're not called to talk like the world. You're called to be different. You're not called to be weird, but you're called to be different. That's it. This is who we are. Watch this. Jesus goes on, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. He's not done. He's giving you another illustration. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Hey, any idea what the brightest humanly produced light is? Any idea? It's the Luxor lamp at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. It was constructed back in 1993. It kind of went with the whole glitz and glamour of Las Vegas and that kind of thing. On a clear night when that beam shines, it can be seen 275 miles away. It can be identified from uh, high-altitude aircraft. When it operates at full power, the system costs more than $100 an hour for electricity. When it comes to light, Jesus is calling us to be visibly different than other people. He's calling us to stand out. Jesus is saying, as God is light, as the Father is light, as as I am light, I need you to be like us. I need you to be like, like light. I need you to be the light. I need you to shine forth the light everywhere you go, back to school, back to work, in your neighborhood, in in that meeting, in the thing, everywhere, everywhere you are, I need you to shine the light. Think about about how he says, he says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, if you get the opportunity to go to Israel and you go with us, we went back in 2020, right before the world closed. We, we went and we were there in the Galilee region. And so we're there and we're, we're in the spot where he's telling uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and you, you see, you can see cities, you can see places, villages that are on hillsides. And you go, oh, it's kind of like that over there. I was like, yeah. The point is simple. You can't hide a city on a hill. A city on a hill is rather public. You don't hide it. Can I say something? You can't hide a church on a hill. You can't. You can't, P.S., we won't. We will not hide. We will not compromise. We are the people of the living God who stand on the Word of God. We will not compromise. We will not bend the knee. We will not capitulate. We will not roll over. We will not go away. We will stand up. We will proclaim. We will not back up, let up, or shut up in the name of Jesus. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. He is the living Christ. He is the one who made everything and for whom everything is made. There is one name in heaven and earth where salvation is found. His name is Jesus. There will be a day, one day, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. That is who we stand on. That is who we worship. That is who we adore. That is who we preach about. That's who we pray to. And that is who we serve in the name of Jesus. We will not be hidden. You can't. You can't hide a city on a hill. It is what it is. We will boldly and unashamedly be a beacon of salvation and light in a place that is dark. We will. We will offer people the help, hope, and healing that is found in one name and one name alone, Jesus. We will be the community that offers all of that to the least and the last and the lost unapologetically. This is who we are. Gang, listen to me. We are called the salt of the earth. We are called the light of the world. This is our identity. It's who we are. It's, it's, this is just identity. Now, people identify with a lot of different things, right? Think about it. Like, you know, there's some people you identify with your favorite sports team. Okay, you won two. Great. Okay, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that, that's, that's cool. I mean, you know, we, we haven't. Yes, it's no big deal. I'm a Tennessee fan. Y'all pray for me. Maybe I'll get saved one day. Don't know. I'm not sure. Sometimes we identify with people. We identify with groups of people, you know. We identify with political parties. Like sometimes we wrap our identity too tightly around our political party. We identify with our hobbies, We identify with those people that we love and those people that we care for. We sometimes even have this way of identifying around things that we don't have or or things that we don't own, as well as things that we do own, like our homes or our cars or a boat or a thing or whatever. We identify with our job. 
Oh, what do you do? It's what we say to people. The very first thing generally comes out, what do you do? You know? So we identify automatically with, with what we do. We identify with culture. We identify with our ethnicity. Sometimes we identify with maybe uh, our first language, or we call that the heart language, you know, if, it, if English is not yours. We identify with our backgrounds. We identify with a lot of many different things in this life. But Jesus, who is the light for the whole world and for all people, he transcends all of those things that we would identify with. Jesus is greater than your sports team. He's far greater than your political party. Amen and hallelujah. He is far greater than our ethnicity. He's far greater than our color, creed, class, etc., so forth and so on. He is greater than all of that. And so it's no wonder that when Paul the Apostle writes to this church in Ephesus, he says these words in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, this is why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven or on earth is recognized by him. Oh, thanks be to God that our identity is grounded in Jesus and nothing else. It's not grounded in our sports teams. It's not grounded in our politics. It's not grounded in our denomination. It's not grounded in anything but Jesus Christ as expressed in the word of the living God. This is it. Two weeks ago, we saw this. We saw, we saw identity bestowed upon Jesus and affirmed on Jesus when he came to the waters and was baptized. And two weeks ago, we challenged you. We gave you an opportunity to come. And when you came here and we came to the table, you could either take that stone that if you were baptized, carry it with you in your pocket. It just kind of serves as a reminder that you are the baptized. But we also said there are those of you in the room, and we know this, you're not baptized. Or maybe you've got children who want to be baptized or you'd like to have baptized. We said, take that vial of water. And we just said, stick it in your pocket, carry it around with you. And so we invite you to be baptized. So on February 12th, you're going to have an opportunity to be baptized. Here's what I need you to do. Scan the QR code. Man, we want to baptize you. We want to baptize you. And if you got a, you took one of those vials, here's what we want you to do. We just want you on that day, we want you to take your vial and we want you to pour it in. And we just want, because what you're doing is you're just becoming part of the whole. You're becoming a part of who this family is and this faith family. You're being drawn into the, into the vastness and the mysterious nature of a loving, a holy God. We want to baptize you. Again, scan that code. You let us know. We want to baptize you on February 12th. This is, this is who we are. We're called to be salt, called to be light, called to be the people of the kingdom. We're the followers of this king who has this all-powerful rule and reign over all creation. We're we are called to be the baptized, which are the sons and daughters of God. By the way, I would just simply tell you, baptism doesn't save you. Okay, Jesus saves you. Baptism is the action on the back end of that that just lets you know who you are. It draws you into this mysterious nature and these mighty acts of God. So if you've ever wondered, if you've ever wondered, like, how do I fully embrace everything that God is doing? How do I participate in God's embrace in our life? I would tell you that the biblical key, as I understand it, and the imagery is baptism. Here's why. It is the pattern of our spiritual life. It is immersion into the life and death of Jesus Christ. It is when we, we every day, every day what we should be doing is taking off the old self, clothing ourselves in Christ. We should be dying to Christ and rising to new life. And for us as Methodists, it's not about the quantity of water. It's the fact that we use water and that's okay. And so this is who we are. We, we take off the old, we put on the new. We become new people in Jesus Christ. We live out our identity. Who are we? We're salt. <laughs> We're light. We're the people of God. We're called to live differently than the rest of the world. We're called to flavor a corrupt and tasteless culture with the salt of God's amazing grace. This is what we do. This is who Go with us to Israel sometime, and maybe you'll get the chance to go to the Dead Sea. And if you ever have the chance to go down to the Dead Sea, it's the lowest uh, point on planet Earth. Um, uh, how far, I can't remember how far below sea level, but if you're there, it's also the saltiest body of water. Now, ocean water has a salinity of 3.5%. Aren't you glad you came to church today? All this information about salt. I mean, it's just fascinating. So uh, ocean water has a salinity of 3.5%. Uh, the Dead Sea is like 33.5%. 7%. So super salty. In fact, so salty that when you get into, and you can get in the Dead Sea, it's no big deal. You, you get into the Dead Sea, 
you, you know what you do, right? You, you float. You do. You do. And so you climb in, right? And you're like not sure what to do because, you know, you get in the ocean water, you're going to sink. So you, you, know, you just sit down. And it sounds goofy. It sounds really crazy, but it is. You have to literally sit back <laughs> into, the, into the water. And then your feet just kind of, you kind of you go into like this zero gravity neutral position. And your feet just kind of go bloop. And they just pop up. And they just pop up. And you're just sitting there floating in the water. Those of you who went in 2020, you're welcome. I'm not showing pictures of us floating in the Dead Sea, okay? But we did. We did. And it's absolutely amazing. It's really cool. Here's why I share this with you. As we come to the end of our time in our sermon, here's, here's the only thing I want you to do this morning. I want you to imagine that you are just in, and just imagine for a moment that that's you and you're in the Dead Sea and all you got to do is just sit down, lean back. Here's what, here's what I'm, I'm going to get you to do an exercise. You're going to lean back into the presence of God and you're just going to sit. Before we come to the table, we're going to sit for about 30 seconds. Now, we're going to float, we're going to rest in the presence of God and we're going to ask God to speak to us anything He wants to say as a result of having been in His Word today. If that sounds good, say yes.